usual thing i i must uh, obviously tell you about how, how risky trading is hopefully you're all big big boys and girls on here now and you appreciate that trading is risky high risk potential high rewards and i hate to see people lose money just because they didn't understand the risk however it's one of those things it's a leverage product it is risky please just be aware of what you're trading uh you know you're uh, hopefully understand what's going on and what we're trying to do here especially if you're trading a cfd product or uh spread bet so today all oh, today we're going to talk about some good stuff i like this guy richard wyckoff so trading with the wyckoff method great quote from wyckoff here the market does not beat them they beat themselves because though they have brains they cannot sit tight <laughs> oh and we're guilty of that right many traders You've got the brains, you've got the understanding of market conditions. We know exactly what we're trying to do, but we don't execute it. We don't execute what we're supposed to be doing. Um, and that just doesn't serve us. So anyway, today, what I'm going to talk about is Wyckoff. And listen, let's be honest. As much as I nerd out on this type of stuff, and as much as you might like this, it isn't going to be a history lesson, right? I'm going to say, thank you, Richard. Thank you for your work, but I just want to take what I believe is going to make me a better trader. And hopefully I'm going to distill that to you and you go, hey, sparks off some ideas. And if you want to go down the history route and dig into what Wyckoff used to have for breakfast and the color of his bed sheets, then you can do that. But I'm going to extract what I think are the most impactful lessons from his work that we can bring in to the 21st century we can use in our own trading. If that sounds good then let's get cracking. By the way, I have, you can see this one, just about uh, a book Wyckoff wrote, aka Rolo Tape, his nom de plume was Rolo Tape, studies in tape reading. Uh, it's not a riveting read, if I'm honest. It's not a it's not a real page turner. <laughs> it's tricky. But, you know, think about when he was trading. Like he was trading sort of 1920s or something. Same stuff, sitting on hands, uh, how price tests levels, um, over trading, starting small, all the stuff we know we should do. These boys were doing it in the 1920s, 30s or whatever. Uh, interesting books worth it. It's a couple of quid on Amazon. Uh, like I say, it's not going to keep you uh, up all night reading it, but it's it's kind of cool, right? And I like this type of stuff anyway. I've got a lot of the old school books. So let's get going. What are going to talk about today? Um, a quick reminder, guys, if you don't know who I am, my name's Mark Holstead, uh, operate tradersmastermind.com. Check that out. It was a recent good podcast episode, actually, with a fund manager who actually trades FX around news. I think you'll really enjoy that one. All the other webinars I've done uh, are on there as well. You can check those out with some more added context to those webinars. And I've got my daily email that I send out each day as well. So go and check that out if you have time and you like this type of stuff. So. I don't have all the answers. Um, I'll try and give you thoughts and ideas and concepts and you take it away, do your analysis, do your research, do your homework and decide to implement it or not. And by the way, that builds confidence, right? Just because you hear something, read something, watch something, doesn't mean you have the confidence to execute it. You need to do your own research analysis. So especially when I talk about the spring setup later, which I think is a beautiful, beautiful trading setup. I think it's great for current conditions. Um, just a nice, really nice, clean, crisp way to express a trade idea. Go go away and look for yourself and, and kind of backtest. And when I backtest, I don't mean going away and, you know, programming and getting all this data and stuff, but just going back and looking and eyeballing the chart and saying, turn, it was there, what happened there, it was there, it was there, it was there. Sometimes that's enough just to build confidence. And if you do decide to change something in your trading plan and strategy methodology, make the change, stick to it for a bit, observe the results. Don't give up just because something's not working. It may well be not effective. And you may be like, you know what? It doesn't really work for me. I don't really want to do it. But you need to stick to it for, for a short period of time and then review and go, okay, I stuck to it for a while. It it was okay. Okay. So like I said, this is not a history lesson, although I will, I will out of respect for the man, and I do respect him, great trader. And I you know, appreciate anyone who shares knowledge about um about trading with others you know that's this part of the game right it's, it can be quite selfish like take 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 but actually giving back and doing stuff like writing these books and sharing his work is is great so we'll do a slide we'll, we'll talk a little bit about him but after that we're going straight into the meat straight into the stuff that's gonna hopefully help you talk about his laws his principles the spring setup i want to spend a lot of time on that one that's going to be the meat of this uh conversation today or this webinar today and as i said 
how can you implement it in your own trading, right? Nice. Thank you, Wyckoff. Cheers. But what's going to help you? You want to make better trades. You want to spot better opportunities. You want to reduce those losers. You want to keep your discipline dialed in, the psychology on point, all this other stuff. That's what you want. So that's what I'm going to try to extract and kind of in my mind, muddling around, put it onto slides and give it to you now so you can hopefully take it and make better trades with it. So Richard Wyckoff, a brief history. I think it was, it's a price action OG. He was a tape reader, um, just like Jesse Livermore did, reading price, reading how price responded to levels, the speed of the tape, the pace of the tape, you know, all this type of stuff. Um, really, really, really interesting character. In 1917, he produced a newsletter, which he stopped because he got too much publicity. I think he thought it might erode his edge. That's not the only person who'd done that. Actually, Toby Crable did the same with one of his books. In uh, 1932, he produced two courses, Stock Market Science and Techniques and Tape Reading and Active Trading. And how they delivered, like in a binder or something? Who knows back then? They definitely weren't delivered online, obviously. Um, so, yeah. But a lot of these guys did this because they wanted to distill in their mind, well, number one, passing on knowledge. Number two, sometimes your mind is cluttered with all these ideas and thoughts and getting it down into a concise sort of course or program or book really helps Get you, get you clarity as well. So there's, all, there's some selfish reasons for doing this as well, these these courses. So, oh, let's skip through too many. There we go. Core principles. Well, I've done a lot of stuff. I don't want to cover the stuff that I don't think is valuable, but these three things are, I think they're super valuable, right? So we're going to pause on them for a moment. Supply, demand, cause and effect, effort versus result. So these are the core principles. Supply demand dictating market direction. What I mean by this, and this is something that's on it is really worth thinking about and getting your head around rather than looking at charts, just numbers on a screen and, and candles and all this stuff. It's like, okay, what's actually happening? Supply demand. When we have more demand coming in, so if someone wants something more, price moves higher. More supply, price moves lower. But it's not quite as simple as that, right? Because for every buyer, we have to have a seller. If I want to buy a million shares of something, if someone has to sell me a million shares of something. Now, if that seller is sitting right there, then a transaction is going to take place right at that point in time, and we're just going to execute at one price. But if now that million shares is not that many people who want to sell, I might move the price massively. And that's when supply demand comes in. You think about that happens with any any auction process or pro, or, or, or um in a market that's derived by by buyers and sellers, you know, house, the housing market, you know, there's massive demand for a specific area. Prices go through the roof because there's not enough supply. People are prepared to pay higher and higher price. There's not more buyers and sellers. You know, it, there's just buyers are prepared to pay more, right? Because a transaction has to take place. And you could say there are more buyers in the wings potentially coming in and that's creating the demand. But ultimately, a buyer and seller has to transact. Think about it. You've got kids, right? Christmas is a sort of toy that they all want, gets sold out in the store. And what happens on eBay? It goes on eBay and prices move higher and higher and higher. And it's literally an auction on eBay. And people are paying more and more and more and more because they need to get that toy under the tree on Christmas Day. And there's not enough supply. They've sold out. They've got these sick people who've been buying them. And so demand goes through the roof. Price goes through the roof. If the other way around, if there was some oversupply of something, then price has to go lower. You get it. But thinking about markets through that lens is so, so important. It is so, so important. Okay. Cause and effect. Uh, or otherwise known as context, right? So context. That's the good wrapper to look at this through or lens to look at this through a wrapper to think about it. So understanding and anticipating these movements by previous actions. That's a long-winded way of saying, hey, how has price got to where it is? How has price moved, right? Imagine a price range is sitting in a range. It's about to test the low of the range, pops back up. Think of the context. If that's after market pre market's previous actions were a huge bull run, that suddenly becomes a high tight flag. I'm probably buying that. If it's right at the lows, I probably ain't buying that because it's probably just one test before it's going to go with another leg lower. If it's sitting in the middle of a range, eh, nobody cares. So the previous actions are super, super important. You know, when you think about um, like a full intraday reversal, many of you intraday traders out there, the market's rallied hard, reverses back, intraday undoes all the gains, goes through lows. There's going to be probably a lot of stops there. 
And especially in the context of maybe a bigger down move, two or three D up move, then you get the injury day reversal. There's a lot of traders who are trapped. And that's that's the key to think of it as people, participants, not just lines on a chart. So effort versus result. Now, this is um this is introducing kind of volume into the equation. And I'm I'm on the fence with this, right? Because I think that volume is it's useful, but at the same time, I'm also very mindful that if you add too much into your decision-making process and too many things, you can overcomplicate stuff. So we'll look at it, we'll give it, we'll open-minded and we'll look at it sort of for what it's worth. And it, again, it helps understand why markets are moving in the, in the context of movement. So the volume of trade, the effort required to move something in price. So if a big, bigger border takes a big lot of effort to go through a level, and really the level gets broken and it kind of pops back up. You're like, well, that's a lot of buyers who have been taken out of the market. Or well, if you think to the, to the downside, should I say, so a lot of sellers, 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 a lot of volume, a lot of volume, selling, 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 goes through a level, kind of sits there. That's a lot of sellers who are now no longer selling. They've sold. That liquidity has gone through the market. It's been soaked up and not much is done. You might be like, okay, if you're watching the volume and it spikes and it doesn't really move very far, you're like, okay, well, maybe there's a lot of effort there, but it's not a big result versus, you know, a big movement, medium volume, a big price excursion, but not a lot of effort. So it's worth thinking about that. I don't think it's worth doing anything more than that, but I think it's worth thinking about. Okay. So this is my, I guess this is, I think this is my least favorite part of Wyckoff, but it's the most popular. And I see why, because he talks in market phases, it, it, it simplifies the market movements, accumulation, markup, distribution, markdown. Now to me, and again, I'm, you know, this is my take on things. I, I don't know if I'm right or wrong on it. My take on this is that this oversimplifies the modern market. Um, we have the accumulation, which is like the, the range bound condition at the bottom where price is being bought, being bought, being built, being bought. And then eventually the sellers go, I think we can get a higher price. The buyers want to play more. Supply demand shifts into demand. We get the markup phase where price is pushing higher and higher and higher. Then we get a distribution phase where sellers step in and think it's value. And then the opposite occurs with markdown. I under, I get it. I, what I like about this is it helps you think in phases. So the good thing, here's the positives. Let's do pros and cons on the fly. Pros, it helps you think in phases, right? You've got your spring. That's right, you've got your uh, accumulation, you've got your markup. That spring will come later, by the way. Accumulation markup. So if you're kind of wasting for the trade, you can go, I'm going to wait for the next phase. I want to wait for the markup. I want to wait for this. I've missed a trade. I'm not going to chase it. It helps you think and, and structure your trade and anticipate rather than react. So you can go, okay, I'm going to anticipate the markdown. I'm going to, it helps you think like that. And I like that. I'm, you know, that's a big pro for me. What I don't like so much is that I, you know, very often markets don't exhibit this behavior. Yes, they consolidate. Yes, they mark up. But very often that kind of um, cube distribution at the top is almost like a bull flag, right? It's like a little bull flag and then you get another leg. So fine, dig into it, see if it works for you. But for me, my least favorite part of Wyckoff, but it's the biggest part. It's the biggest part. Okay, so example here. Oh, went, went too far. Bitcoin sitting there, accumulation markup, dump, distribution, mark lower. You get the idea. Okay, so let's kind of pause things for a moment before we move on. Wyckoff main themes. Consider main themes. The effort versus the reward. So the effort it took for what the reward, how much volume came through. Look at the, think of it in context of wide bars versus narrow bars. So how easy did price move? If price is doing narrow bars with big volume, that's tough, that's tough, that's tough. But what does it mean? Does it mean that volume is getting sucked out of the market and we could suddenly snap the other way? Maybe. Think about supply, demand, cause and effect. Supply, demand, that that kind of balance, a lot of price, a lot of demand coming in, price moving higher, demand, 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 choked off by supply, holding big demand and big supply, price won't move. There has to be that imbalance. It has to be that imbalance. And then start thinking about this before we go into springs. The follow through or lack of follow through when that key level is breached. Right, thinking about that, just want to get, just hold that in mind for a moment, and then we'll dig into that in a second. And then how price is interacting with the trend lines, the channel support and resistance, same as four, but it's thinking of that in terms of supply and demand, because that really starts to unlock uh, a complete different lens that you look at the market through. And I think once you do that, 
confidence improves, clarity improves in your setup. And then you start to kind of look and go, well, that, what does that mean for supply and demand? What's actually happened there? It might be that prices move from here to here. Fine, that's objectively the, the, the truth. But what else really happened? So something to consider. Um, and how can that help you, right? Because this is what it's about. It's about helping you improve your trading. Three main points, right? Three main points you can take away from that before we go into the to springs. Thinking in terms of supply and demand, I've mentioned that so many times. Uh, and I, honestly, I really think that's such a good, good way of looking at the markets. Supply, demand. Then we look at uh, you know the price cycles to help you anticipate, not react. Again, I think the limited limited value to a certain extent, but I think that the cycles help you anticipate what the next cycle will be. And maybe you don't think those cycles are true, like you're going to have distribution and markup. Blah, blah. Maybe you think, okay, that's not really what I want to do, but market definitely moves in phases, right? It breaks out, it then consolidates. Maybe there's another leg, consolidates, backfills. There's definitely chunking to the market, especially intraday, and help and thinking like that, even if the cycle, your cycles don't match, Wyckoff helps you anticipate, not react, because I bet... A lot of your portraits come from reacting, seeing something, diving in and wishing you hadn't. So that's something to consider. And then the final thing is making context your North Star. You know, just really appreciating the context of the market. Right now, equity markets pretty much near all-time highs. You know, when we get some movement to the downside, what's the context on that? The context of that is we're in an uptrend. Will, will we reverse at some point? Yes. But, but trying to predict that all the way up since whatever it is, mid-November, um, would have just been fruitless. It would have been absolutely awful for you. So the context of the strength underlying, there's this, there's that, uh, and really seeing how that fits into the price action you're seeing, the setup you're seeing. Um, always a great example, actually. I forgot to put this slide in. I did. Context. Two charts. 15-minute chart of nat natty gas, natural gas. 15-minute chart of NASDAQ or Pepperstone's equivalent, US 100. Pretty similar, right? Pretty similar. Come off the highs, a little bit of resistance up there, backed off lower, Pushing to lows. They're not identical, of course, but they're recent charts. These are very, very recent. Pretty similar. But look at the context. Natural gas, big scale, heavy downtrend, smash from highs after being up. And US 100 is pretty much at all time highs. Context, very, very different. Very, very different. How you interpret that is the trader in you. That's the trader in you. But just appreciating the context, it's very different. Okay. How long have we got? We've got some time. Trading springs. Okay, I love these springs. I have to say, these are one of one of my favorite setups. I used to call them a range break fake, and I kind of still do because the way I look at it is slightly different. But actually, I, I, honestly, I didn't know that Wyckoff had done this kind of springs work until I dug into it. I was like, that's like my range break fake. I'd looked at it through that lens of supply, demand, imbalance, and the shift of, of, of the dynamic nature of the market and who's in control and came up with this, this kind of setup. And Wyckoff's already done the work. I could have just read his book and I would have got it from there without doing all the work. Anyway, Springs is a is a good way to get long, basically, or could consider getting long. I never say you should do something. Of course not. But it's a good thing to consider, right? If you are looking at a market going, how can I get long? A spring setup is not a bad way of doing it because it quantifies the risk, it waits for the fake out, and it makes sense from a supply demand, supply demand imbalance perspective, which we'll look at in a moment. Okay, so fundamentally, this is what it is. It's a test of a support level, and the market breaks that level and comes back into the range. You're like, Mark, Mark, that's just a pin bar, that's just a wick. Yeah, it's that type of thing. There's more to it, which we'll go into in the next couple of slides, but think about what's happening. Price is congesting, sitting there, supply demand is imbalanced, it's sitting, nothing's going on. All of a sudden, it breaches a level that everyone's watching. Could be an intraday low, multi-day low, decent support level, not just a random level, decent level. Maybe a whole number if you're trading crude or uh, what else, whole number stuff, like gold or even uh, some of the big old numbers on, on Forex. Breaks through, pops back up. What is that saying? That's saying, hey... We put it, especially put a lot of effort to go through. Got a lot of effort to go through. Breach the price. Looked around. Nothing's happening. Pop back up. The response is key. We'll look at that. But that's the fundamentally what we're looking for. The test of support breaks the level, comes back into the range. Okay, so let's pause for a moment and think. What would Wyckoff do? <laughs> do you know, I, uh, it was funnier when I wrote the slide, right? What would Wyckoff do? It was funnier when I wrote the slide. I admit, I'm kind of laughing at my own stupidity here um yeah what would what would wyckoff do let's think for a moment what would he do context the position of the spring you know that that's key right 
and the underlying trend? Is it a big uptrend on the springs and a flag? Is it a big downtrend? Context. Effort and a result. How much effort it took to get through that support and didn't follow through. And that's really the key of the spring, right? The push through. Um, Wyckoff did talk a lot about this composite man theory, which is smart money, which I'm not going to go into. His theory was, you know, and okay, there's probably some credence to it. It's liquidity hunting. It's kind of pushing through the levels. In actual fact, uh, if I digress slightly, uh, years ago, I used to listen to the Traders Pit audio, which was a live stream from the S&P 500 pit. And there was a guy who used to be kind of talking about it, going, you know, is it, locals are bidding at, oh, what oh, he kind of say this in his funny little auctioneer type voice. And then he'd come in and say, oh, you know, so-and-so's coming in. Anyway, long story short, you'd have a number one local and actually, you can read the full thing. Actually, I've got a blog. I've got a blog post about it on my on the website. But the um, you'd have a one of one local who would, when the market was quiet, would push the market through a key a prior day's low or a current day's low. And when he saw all that kind of all the stop orders come in, he would cover into those. He'd make some money and walk out. I'm simplifying it and again going really up, going really for interest in that. But the point is, is that was. Of pushing to levels that was you know trying to get price to trigger something trigger stops knowing there's stops there so not saying that the market is doing it on purpose someone's pushing it but it's often a natural move to liquidity not a natural often natural move that's why you know we see these wicks and you know it the market you trade you see these wicks you see these tails all the time little probes through levels and we don't want to take every one of them but if it's in the right context then it can be a good setup so some of these actually from my archives, you know, I kind of store lots of setups and, you know, document some of them. So there's a couple here, I think are from a couple of years ago, but I've got some more uh, you know, recent ones as well for you. This is the type of thing, right? You've got this support level that everyone's watching. This is NASDAQ, by the way, drive up, pushes lower, tests again, right? And probes through intraday, daily chart, comes back up, closes at highs, and that's a spring, bang, for price to catapult through to highs. Now, in perfect scenario, this would be breaking out to highs. This one doesn't rolls back over. Fine, I should get a second kind of spring here in a way, um, but it rolls over. So it's that it's that concept, right? And nothing's nothing's perfect, guys. There's no perfect trade out there, but this is pretty good. This one comes through, probes through, think about what's happening, takes a bit of liquidity out, closes at highs, which is kind of what Wyckoff liked to see the market closing at highs after it tested through the level, and the next day, you know, you can see it's just been like four or five days of just pure pure bull action bang bang massive um demand coming in it's a one-way street and then eventually it kind of rolls over but the, the setup is that so another example here is the recent one i've got for you. i'm scrolling too quick on my mouse uh yeah recent one on natural gas no i've got a couple of natural gas examples maybe it's because it's in in play at the moment five minute chart rolls over and by the way it is better on a daily there's no doubt about it but you, you you can kind of play this on a on a lower time frame but you just got to understand that you know just because it goes through a couple of minutes doesn't really indicate that much of a movement. Whereas a daily chart price going through means it's probably been there for a few hours. Not necessarily, of course, it could be five minutes still, but generally speaking. So the same type of thing, right? Market moves lower. You get this little kind of dip through. This is a little bit longer than normal. And then the spring kind of snaps back up and you get a white coffin almost says like a one to 10 bar movement. Uh, we'll, we'll touch on a moment sort of stops and, and, and targets for it. But that's what Wyckoff kind of says. Wyckoff says, hey, one to 10 bar movement. But it's that probe through. It's that little kiss through. And the thing about it and why he called it a spring is it kind of went through. No one was there. And then whoa, unleashed like a, a lot of demand. Um, Another one here, uh, I think this was cable. Why didn't I put the uh, 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 yes, cable there is there. Um, And by the way, I, I included this as context. Context is so key. You know, would you probably take this? Maybe not. And why it probably failed is that the context is of natural gas, same as the chart before. It's right at lows. It's not looking great. But I wanted to show you the chart to kind of give you these different ideas and look at the various differences in context with the springs going back to Wyckoff's initial thing. So the markdown is a kind of type of spring and it pops back up, markup context. It's in a range bound condition. Uh, I think I've got one more for you. Here we go. Let me go back a second. Uh, this is, I like this type of context is that it pushes up, probes below. This one actually opened below, closes at highs. And it's in the in the context of, a, of an uptrend. So it's a much more powerful signal in an uptrend, pull back in an uptrend, pause in an uptrend because it's pent up buying, waiting. And then when sellers don't get 
that control, a lot of them are scrambling. A lot of them are scrambling to get out. Okay, so let's look at the rules, right? Let's go through rules. A couple of hands up here. I'll, I'll, I'll remember that question and put it in the Q&A uh, if you can. I'll get to it at the end, I promise you. Or are we we're good for time? Um, so the rules. A penetration of a key support level. That move fails quickly. You don't want the price to be under there for multiple days in a row. It just is nowhere near as strong. It's got to kind of go, kiss the level, straight back out. And thinking again, supply demand. Lots of demand, lots of demand. No, no, no. We start rolling over, start rolling over. Now supply, now supply, now supply. Goes through the level, reaches the level, and it sort of looks around. It's like, we're not going any lower here. And then sellers back off or buyers step up one or the other, and then whoosh, starts to kind of push the highs or push back up through the level and then it accelerates even harder. So the move fails quickly, goes back up, closes preferably above the support level. That's even better. We'll talk a little, little nuances at it at the moment. Um, and the subsequent reaction bar is strong. Now, I don't know if Wyckoff wanted that. Maybe he did, but I like that. For me, that's got to be, that's 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 the key. After it's pro through the level, I don't want it messing around near those lows. I don't like it. I'm not interested. I just, ugh. Oh, it makes me shudder thinking about it. I don't want to take it long after we've probed through that low. I want to see it probe through the low, take out the stops, close at highs, and then that reaction bar after it is strong. Now, how you get into that, up to you. You want to take a break of the kind of signal bar break or the trigger bar? Great. Do you want to get long kind of an opening range breakout? That's when you start to mold together two different types of strategies. I've, I've talked before in here about the opening range breakout trade. Um, you know, that's the sort of day you go, Hey, we've got a spring set up on day one, day two. I want to get long. How do I get long? I might use an opening range breakout type trade, intraday trigger for a multi-day move. And so that's, that's kind of how we're positioning stuff. The reaction bar has got to be strong. Uh, stops under the recent low as a, as a, um, a slight caveat to that, which I'll get to in a moment, but you, if you think about what's happened, like price has stretched thing through the low snap back. You don't want it to revisit. There's a caveat in a moment, but you don't want it to revisit. So you're quite happy putting a stop under that low because the thesis of the trade is we've sniffed through the level, we've attracted some sellers, we've run out of steam, we're now rotating, we're going to rip to the high side. Um, so that's key. That's key. And then targets, Wyckoff said one to a, uh, between a one and 10 bar move. So in a daily chart, which is what Wyckoff was working on generally, I think with the springs, or maybe four hour, something like that, he wouldn't, he never go down to kind of a, a lower time frame with the springs. I don't believe, I might be wrong, but does that say you, you can't use it on that? Yeah, maybe you can, maybe you can, you've got to be cautious. So targets one to 10 bars, which means you're holding for, you know, one to 10 days and then using a judgment. When it's running out of steam, you go, okay, I'm done. It's run out of steam. It's not having the same aggression anymore. And that's the nature of trade. Now, if you want to then fold it into a bigger trade, then that's up to you. And I think there's a sweet spot to be there and something to be said for doing that. You get that trigger entry, you get the spring, it, re it retraces, snaps back, you get along, it starts to push, and you go, actually, I want to stay long this because I think it's going to break up to uh, last highs. That's okay. And that's, obviously, it's up to you and what your strategy is and what your methodology is. But Wyckoff said one to 10 bar move is, is kind of the sweet spot. So some extra things to consider before we look at some nuances with this. According to Wyckoff, range duration doesn't matter. So how long it sits in a range doesn't matter. As much as it pains me, I, like, I, I disagree with him a little bit here, um, purely because I think the longer you're in this range, the more tests you get. So, you know, I think that Context is absolutely super important, but I don't want it to be too long. I want it to kind of look like it's going to, it has to have a decent range. It can't just be the next candle because that's a, that's almost like a downtrend, right? You need to have some decent duration, but not forever. Some duration where there's a bit of a battle going on, volume is reasonable, people hypothesizing when it break to highs, break to lows, and then it probes to lows and then it does the spring. Uh, springs in the direction of the bigger trend can work better. Absolutely. You know, you get a spring and a bull flag. Brilliant. Love those type of trades. I'm all over those. If the market's on, if the market I'm watching, I've got a, a thesis of we're moving higher and I see that bull flag. I kind of push the spring into it. I know that's not really how Wyckoff really wanted it to trade. He preferred to have it coming down. I know those cycles and stuff. And we showed you examples of where the spring fits into that. But for me, I, I, you know, any probe below a support level that pops back up quickly, just it just structures the trade nicely, doesn't it? Because you know where your stop's going to be. 
you've got a good leg in, you kind of, it makes sense price action wise. It makes sense for supply demand imbalance. Uh, and it's, it's just a trade I look at and go, why not? Well, my risk is X. My reward hopefully is two, three, four, five X. Then I, I, I take the trade. A volume can play a big role. He said that a good short-term opportunity, one to 10 bars. That was the way he played it. He said, listen, one to 10 bars, it runs, starts to run out of stuff, uh, run out of steam. And it doesn't always indicate the start of a new trend, but if you're in the higher time frame, like I mentioned earlier, you might kind of mold it into a, a bigger trade. Uh, we looked at this one, um, Greg. So in fact, let me just show you like the one to ten, uh, one to ten bars on this type of thing. So yeah, perfect, right? You get the spring, you get one, two, three, four, five. It starts running out of steam. So when it starts running out of steam, and probably when it takes that prior low, you're done. And you're out the trade. That's the thesis of it. Now, how you manage it is up to you. Maybe you take it out when it runs that high. Maybe you're you know, looking for a bit more of a bigger move. Maybe you just hold it for one day. You know, that that's entirely up to you. But that's the thesis. Same here. Starts to run out of steam. Uh, just takes out the prior low here. I know it's a smaller chart. Same type of thing here. This is a little bit grubby, a little bit of a, uh, you know, not not the best example, but it's the most recent one I um, had in my in my, in my uh, documents. So you get a little test here. And it just kind of eventually one, two, three, four, five. It took a while to get going reversed on you which you might get caught out on that but it's there you know not every trade is going to work out uh many stops going below that low okay so let's bring volume into the equation because this is important um so wyckoff liked to say this that if price uh had high volume then the spring would be retested what i mean by the spring being retested what i mean by the spring being retested is that, that that probe, so you've got your support, price probes through. If that's on big volume, there's a good chance, Wyckoff said this, and I tend to agree with him on this, that there's a good chance that the next day we go into that range again and maybe just breach that low, which is why I said a couple of slides ago, there's a little caveat to putting your stop under the low of that spring. Because if it's high volume, there's a good chance it gets tested once more, maybe twice more before going. Just because of the volume behind it, now, if it's low volume, Wyckoff is always saying, listen, I don't think we get a spring retest. We just probe through, we pop back up, and we're off to the races. Off we go, balls are back in town, get long, get your risk managed, off you both play the game. But if it's high volume, there's often a second kiss of that level. So, and again, in context, right? Um, and why is this good to know? It's good to know if you're trade positioning. You don't tighten that stop up too tight, is how I look at things, when you get that high volume. Here's some examples. And again, some of these are from, from my archives. Um, we've got uh, this kind of probe here. Good move up, but it's quite high volume, right? It's quite high volume. Uh, and then the next day, we get a test again, and then it goes. So the high volume peak here, relatively compared to the average, you see the peak here, this is the average, good it's high volume. And if you go and wipe off what Wyckoff said, Wyckoff said this, listen, if it's high volume, then prepare for a second test. And that's exactly what we got. He was spot on with this. You got a second test the next day, which actually breached that low. And then it closed above. And then it finally got going. A little bit of a shudder here, but it finally got going. And then we're one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten bars. And then the next phase started to come in. So that's that's something to look out for. Uh, again, a little peak higher than average volume intraday chart here, five minute chart, little tiny. Is it a spring setup? Maybe, maybe, maybe I'm stretching the, the things a little bit, but as a drive and as a context, I wanted to kind of point out, it didn't really close at highs here. It went through, bearing in mind, it's a five-minute chart, so it's not so important. High volume, relatively high volume, it's not huge, but it's saying higher than average, and it took another one little probe more and pushed back up. Um, and here we've got one here. This is kind of drive up on Euro Yen. It's pushed, it's, it's consolidated, drive higher. We start to get the little probe through. We get multiple probes because the volume is slightly higher than normal before it finally gets going. So there's something to be really aware of with that. A couple of more examples here uh, on DAX. Five-minute chart, pushing lower. There's your spring, pulse back up. Off we go, get a good 10-bar move. It's that little probe below the low, don't forget. That's really the kind of meat of it, the context of it. Uh, another one here on DAX, uh, pushing lower. Kind of get a reasonable range. It just has a little sniff below, takes out a few players, and then you get that kind of 10-bar move back to the VWAP. Nice little clean trade that. Again, lower time frame. So, you know, up to you how you decide to play that. But you can see how good the risk-reward ratio is. 
And by the way, you know, we this is nothing nothing new, right? We see these wicks and tails and tests all the time. And I think one of the big takeaways is whether you kind of use Wyckoff structure or your own is that very often price is going to test these levels. So if you're desperate to get long, why not wait for a test? Because it's number one, it's a great place to put your stop. And number two, it's a price improvement. Now your argument might be, ah, you know what, price is going to go without me. And it, it might do from time to time. Of course, does this always happen? No, but because the trade becomes... I think the expected value of the trade goes up. The, the stop loss position becomes more obvious. It means you can take more size to structure the risk reward better. I think it's just all round better to just say, right, I'm just going to wait for that test. Once it tests and fails, I'm going to get in. I know my stop's going to be, and I'm going to leave the damn thing. That's the way that I kind of like to look at it. Um, and the main notion of these springs is the lack of follow through. That's the key. And I guess you, you, you get this from kind of some examples in the way I talk about this. If price goes through, sits there and goes through again, that's not a spring. It's the fact that it's gone through, pushed back, and using that as a springboard to explode higher. Um, can you trade it in reverse? Absolutely, you can. Wyckoff only talked about from the long side because I guess he wanted to align with the bigger trend on equities and, and the uh, indices. But can you trade it on the other side? Of course. Just be aware of the context, right? You're not taking that. You take that in a bull market, it is just not going to work. Same as you take springs alongside in a bear market. Context, context context okay let's finalize with some of the rules here um okay and then a summary of some of the main points so rules trade with the direction of the trend optional if you think there's a reversal happening as long as it's not a mega downtrend i'm probably okay with that mega downtrend i'm avoiding it keep an eye on volume watch the close position you want that close really back above that support next bar response is key that's really the kind of confirmation you need probe through the low pushes back up next bar is aggressive you know there you go there's good a good chance of any that's going to work does it always work <laughs> no but that's a good way you can structure your stop and you can see this sequence happening stop goes under the spring test unless of course it's high volume like i said then you might either wait for another test to take it or have a slightly wider stop it ruins the risk order ratio of the trade i get it but it means that you can um you know appreciate the context what's happening and say hey there's probably a chance that we get a second test here look for a one to ten bar hold closing at highs on each bar is preferable when it starts to run out of steam you kind of want to get out of the trade uh look at the price range price close and the volume all together holistically overused word unknown trading but that's that's really the key so four main things um uh, of of wyckoff looking at price through the lens of supply demand game changer well worth putting some effort in for that Effort versus result. How much effort it takes, what result the market's got. Context, context, context. You know, done a lot of these webinars now and you know, often I, I share strategies and ideas and thoughts and and ways to look at the market. And without, without any exception, understanding the context of what you're looking at, or why you're looking at it is so, so important. So never forget that. And then, of course, went over the rules of the Springs setup. Uh, okay, little reminder there if you want to join my email list i send that email every day 7 30 a.m sharp uh, i've got seven or eight thousand people on that at the moment growing nicely you guys seem to enjoy it i got some some questions i know we're late but i got some some questions if you have them ladies and gents please put them in if i can help you I absolutely will if i can't i will try to um guide you somewhere <laughs> okay will there be a void of this i guess you mean do you mean video recording, Andre? Yes, there will be episode. We'll get that sorted out and we'll be up on their YouTube channel. If you're listening on YouTube, watch on YouTube, hello. I'll also put a copy up on my site as well. Uh, Peter says, if you haven't studied Wyckoff, then this is a must. No excuses. Agree. There's no reason not to. It's a simple thing. And, and it just, I think Peter will agree with me here. Um, and by the way, Peter does the calls uh, in the uh, Interest Mastermind weekly calls. It just helps you think differently about stuff rather than you're looking at price of these squiggly lines and trying to overanalyze it and you don't see any you don't see any rhythm to it. You don't see any heartbeat to the market. You just see red, green, green, red, and you kind of look at it too clinically. Wyckoff, you know, the way he looks at it has a way of making these come alive and you see the supply-demand imbalance. You see the shift. You see these probes and tests, these break retests, all this, all this stuff. It means as people, you start to see the people who are involved in the transaction rather than just seeing you know, the numbers. And I think that's important because whether you're trading back in the 1930s and your Wyckoff or whether you're trading now in 2024, it's people. 
And even though algos are doing a lot of trading, as people program the algos, the same psychology, this greed, this fear, it's absolutely imperative, I think, to uh, to study Wyckoff to a certain extent. Um, will there be a recording available? Yes, absolutely, Eugene. Uh, okay. Jacob, how, hi, Mark. Hi, Jacob. How many strategies do you deploy actively at the same time? Imagine you have a quite large library. How do you keep track of what's working right now? Jacob, honestly, one or two, one or two at one time. I've got a ton. Yeah, you're right. I've got a ton. But I, I kind of just want to use the best for now. Example at the moment, a couple of things. And yeah, you know, sometimes I deploy them for a week, right? The reverse opening range break is something that's that I'm deploying. Right now. And we'll, maybe I'll talk about that in more detail at some point, which is, you know, fading that opening range break because at the moment everyone's waiting for NFP and Fed. So likelihood of, you know, big opening range drive, pretty low. So I wheel that out under these conditions, trade with that for the few days and done. And then if we go into a new rhythm, a new structure, depending on what Fed says, depending on what NFP comes out at, depending on what's from the big boy earnings coming up, I'll then maybe move to, you know, bull flag, bear flag type stuff, uh, you know, probe and retests. I'll just kind of, I'll try to match the current conditions uh, and the context, 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 the trade. Well, the six o'clock shock, I think I've shared with you guys, working very, very well at the moment. That's going to stop working because the market's going to change rhythm. I uh, just like fading the open range break is going to kill you when you get into a trending environment. But I won't operate it. Then. I know when to back out of it and when to change it. So yeah, I've got I've got an absolute ton, Jacob. Uh, but really, one or two, one or two, uh, and that's not because I don't think there's more that can be effective. It's just because I just tried to cherry pick. I go listen. I feel like this is going to happen in the morning. I feel like this might happen in the evening. If it happens, I take a trade. If it doesn't, I won't. Done. You know, I'm not going to overcomplicate things. Um, yeah, it's a good question. I think that helps to really build a library of strategies. But again, the the it's context where you deploy the strategy. Because if you deploy in the wrong conditions, it's useless. It's, it's not going to work for you. Uh, Rob Reed, how you doing, Rob? Um, Mark's, Mark, how do you structure your take profit, time-based trail, fixed target? Um, with the spring setup... Now, if I'm trading a range break fake, which is my version of the springs, there's always a high, like a range. So it's a range. It probes the low like a spring and then probes the high. For me, I'm often adding on a break at that high and looking for kind of further extension targets. And I'm using that spring as a lever to get in. Um, Boykoff uses a one to 10 day move. One way of doing it, if you wanted to do it systematically, would be to say, if you breach the low of the prior day, you're out. So day one, solid green bar. Day two, a little bit less. Day three, if it then breaches the low or 50% of the bar, if it's a big bar, you might be like, hey, I'm done. It's momentum play. And I think that's what Wyckoff intended, if I'm honest. You know, he intended it to be a real momentum play. And so one to 10 days move and you're done. And so when it starts, the momentum starts to die, otherwise, you know, the range of the bar starts to decrease. You start to take out prior days low, uh, maybe a moving average, something like that. Some indication of momentum's dying, price catches up with the move. Oh, sorry, moving average catches up with price. That might be a signal to get out. For others, if you've got a bigger idea and bigger theme, maybe it's a signal to, to add to the trade if you think the context is right. Um, so yeah, time based, one to 10 days, taking out prior low, uh, some sort of moving average catch up. That type of thing is the way that I would. Uh, way I would operate it. Uh, have we got anything else? I think we are done. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, for your time this evening. I hope it's been valuable. I hope you've got something to take away and implement into your own trading. I'm sure there's only a couple of pounds on Amazon. Really cool, interesting read. Uh, Richard Wyckoff, aka Rolo, Rolo Tape. What a name. <laughs> what a name. All right. Thanks, guys. Take care. I shall see you on the next one. Bye bye. Thank you.